Hey, I just want to let you know, we've got some incredible things coming up with, with Easter, and then following Easter, we've got our, um, it's going to be our 15-year anniversary as a church, and, um, and so we've got some really neat things planned that we are just excited. We want you to be a part of it. I know that as the weather begins to turn, it starts to look nicer outside, the sun is shining, it's super tempting to not come to church on Saturday evening or Sunday morning. But isn't it great that we have two opportunities? So you can take your Saturday, you can enjoy the sun, and then you can come back to church or, or on Sunday morning or vice versa, but we want you here. Uh, we're gonna have some incredible things that are going on. Good Friday is gonna be two different gatherings that we're gonna have up at Mac Church. You'll see all of that information as we get closer to that. But I just wanna, I wanna make you aware that, that as we get towards the end of next month, we've got some very cool things planned uh, as we are going to celebrate 15 years of River of Life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we are in a series, if you haven't been with us, we, have, we just started it last week called Intervention. And so we're looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, and through the intervention of the Son to reconcile all things to himself, making peace with believers through the blood of his cross, uh, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were one, at one time estranged and alienated and hostile-minded toward him, participating in evil things, yet Christ has now reconciled you to God in his physical body through death in order to present you before the Father holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this reminder of this intervention that you, that you have done. That God, you have stepped into our world and you've said, I love you that much that not only will I step into your world, but I will, I will send my son as an ultimate sacrifice to die on the cross. And God, we're grateful for that. And Lord, I pray in these weeks leading up to that incredible celebration of Easter, I pray that we will be reminded once again of who you are and how much you love us. God, I pray for those who are watching in Star Valley and those who are watching in Malawi and in jail and on the North Slope and wherever they may be. God, I pray that, Lord Jesus, your word will not return void, but God, you will speak directly to the hearts and minds of people. Now, God, I know that as your word is spoken, it changes things. It, it, it brings change. And so, God, that's what we're asking for. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus stepped into our broken world with one purpose, and that was to save us. He came to do what we couldn't do on our own. There was no way that you and I could ever, ever pay the price for our sins. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, And at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It's the greatest intervention in the, in the human story that Jesus would come and that he would die for us. And he moved us in that moment from being slaves to being sons and daughters. And that is incredible as we think about it. I think sometimes we can get caught in this time of year where we just feel like, oh, it's just, it's spring and, and all the things and Easter gets busy. But to take a moment and to say, God, you are so good that you would love me that much, that you would pay this price for me, that you would intervene on my behalf. And so over these last, uh, last weekend and this weekend, uh, we're going to look at a few stories. And, and this one we find in Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36, it says this, uh, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet as she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. 
When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who has forgiven little shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is an amazing story. I love this story. The fact that Jesus comes into this home and he's invited to, to have, have a meal with the Pharisees. And just so you have a little bit of an understanding, tradition and the way that society would work in this day is that as you would enter into somebody's home, you would know somebody's level uh, uh, in society by the way that they're treated when they come in. So if I was to enter into your home and I was let's say, in a position that was higher than you in society, then you as the host would, you would come and you would wash the dust from my feet. If we were equals, you would have your servant come and wash the dust from my feet. If we were, if, if I was below you, then you would at least leave a bowl of water and a towel so that I could wash my own feet. So Jesus enters this home and the homeowner doesn't, not only does he not wash his feet, he doesn't even uh, have his servant wash the feet. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't even offer a bowl of water for Jesus to wash his feet. It's kind of one of those things where I don't know if you've ever been invited to something, but they didn't, the person didn't actually necessarily want you there. Like you got, it's, you're invited, but you're not really invited. You, you can come if you want to, but I don't know that I actually really care enough about you that I, that I would care either way whether you were there or not. And that's basically what Jesus is experiencing in this moment, that they didn't even care enough to leave him a bowl of water to wash his own feet. And the kiss and the anointing of, of oil upon the arrival was symbolic. And so as Jesus enters Simon's home, he receives nothing. And this was a loud message that he sent. So I want us to look at this scene for a moment because there's a lot. As we read it, we can just kind of gloss over some stuff that's pretty important. Jesus finds himself at this religious leader's home, and he's sitting in probably a courtyard where they're kneeling and having a conversation. And now this woman comes in. Now, this is a meeting of probably the, the who's who of around there. So these are the important people. And that's why Jesus was kind of invited. He wasn't really seen as being important, but it was probably a courtesy invite. So as the dinner parties go, that's the way it would work out. But this woman would have no invitation to come to this. So not only was she not invited, she made her way in anyhow. Have you ever stepped into some place that you knew you weren't supposed to be and you watch as maybe people look at you a little bit funny? This woman, not only would they look at her funny, but they would be upset that she was there. But this woman so badly wants to see Jesus that she pushes through the awkwardness. She pushes past the, the ugly stares and the, and the whispers and all the things that were probably being said about her in this moment. And she goes in anyhow. When this woman, this uninvited guest, not just a sinner, but a prostitute, arrives on the scene, can I just tell you that was awkward. And some scholars would say that probably some of the men in the room knew her. But at the very least, they all knew who she was and what she did. And so now she comes and she finds Jesus and she desperately falls at his feet and she begins to cry and weep. And I can only imagine that probably that wasn't necessarily the plan. She probably just was so excited that she was there with him. She begins to cry and, and she's grateful that she's with him. And now she probably sees as her tears fall and they hit Jesus's dusty feet and they begin to make a stream of clean and not clean. And, and she looks around and there's probably no towel because we know he wasn't offered one. And so she, in, in maybe a moment of almost embarrassment, she sees these streaks that she's making. So she lets down her hair and she begins to clean his feet with her hair. This moment of raw desperation, but a moment of incredible love. In desperation, she had heard that Jesus was dining with Simon the Pharisee. And so she, even though she's uninvited, she, she still 
goes. She still shows up. She still knows that she needs to get to him. We see this throughout scripture in Jesus's ministry where there are people who all of a sudden will push through societal norms to try and get to Jesus because there's just something compelling about getting to Jesus. It's amazing to me because uh, as we look at this story, the religious repel people, but Jesus compels them. These religious leaders, they loved their little club. They loved their little group of people and they loved feeling superior to everyone else. And comes in who is desperate and she needs something, but they don't see that. They see the sinner. They don't see the opportunity. And Jesus is reclining. And I think that maybe even somewhat being mistreated and ignored by those who are in the room, they think too highly of themselves. But this woman comes in and she kneels at his feet, as, at his filthy feet and some men probably scorn as they look on and the awkward tension is probably palpable as, as this woman is just now making a scene as she is probably crying out loud and, and just allowing herself to just do whatever she feels she needs to do in this moment. This woman looks around and she feels the usual scorn and condemnation and she's probably in that moment tempted to run but then her gaze goes back to Jesus and this love and this grace emanate from him. Not only does he see her but he seems happy to see her. Isn't that what the church should look like? Isn't that who we should be? That we don't just see people but we're happy to see people. I love, I love watching on Saturday afternoons as the clothing closet is open and the food bank is, is happening and the volunteers are, I mean, it's a well-oiled machine, the things that they pull off, but I love to watch those who go out into the parking lot and meet people because there's always a big smile and often knowing their name and knowing their story and knowing what's going on in their life. And it's not just, I see you, but I'm happy to see you. He seems to not only see her, he knows her and he accepts her. The fear and the hopelessness begin to melt away and peace and joy begin to fill this void inside of this woman. She falls to the ground and she begins to kiss his feet and the tears, like I said, they leave streaks and she sees her tears are doing this. She wipes his feet and all the while Jesus, is, it's, it's probably the best thing ever. He's sitting at a dinner party that nobody wants him there. He's probably being ignored. He's probably being left out of conversation. And yet this woman, she comes and she, she shows him such love and, and such an incredible amount of, of worship. So as I was reading this story again, I, I was drawn to it, it. We also read it in, in the book of Mark. And in the book of Mark, it says that this woman brings this alabaster jar and she breaks it. And she pours it on Jesus. Now, this is a woman who was a prostitute. So most likely, this jar was something that she would most likely have worn around her neck. The reason being is when she would finish with a, a client, she would then pull this, this perfume out and she would then put it on to change the smell. This perfume was expensive. The book of Mark tells us the amount that it would cost and, and it was uh, 300 denarii and that would actually be, for somebody in the, in the lower class, that would be a year's wage. So the, the Pharisees in the book of Mark, the account there says that they said, why would she break that? Why wouldn't she sell it and give the money to the poor? But this woman is having this incredible moment with Jesus See, this woman, this alabaster jar, not only was it an expensive perfume, but it re represented something. It represented a life that said, you've got to change the aroma. This woman knew that the job that she did, the, the things that she was participating in, that she had to always be available to change the aroma. That's why you would spend that much money on something like that so that you can, you can smell fresh all the time. You can smell different than how she probably felt. It was a mask is what it was. But in this moment, we see that she no longer needs the jar. She no longer needs to cover anything up. She pours this flask. She pours her life out on Jesus' feet. 
It's this incredible moment. And what they saw as wasteful, Jesus saw as proof of transformation. Saw this moment of great sacrifice, but it wasn't, uh, it, they saw it as a great sacrifice, but it wasn't. It was a moment of transformation for this woman. This woman who has come in, this, this sinner and this, this woman who has struggled, and, and we don't know how she got to that place in life. We don't know what led her there. We don't know how, how she ended up with that profession. But we know that if, if it's anything like current times, most of the time, that is not a choice. It is a circumstance that happens to someone. And so as much as it is easy for these men to judge, this woman now comes and she, she says, I don't know what it is about this man, but something is changing. As I begin to look to him, as I begin to put trust in him, as I begin to, to understand that there is hope for me, then all of a sudden her life begins to change. And when people's lives get transformed, there should be an action that follows. There should be fruit that comes from that. Yeah. It's amazing to me when we watch people accept Christ and they begin to follow him, how all of a sudden their priorities begin to change. Because now they begin to realize, man, there, there's something different inside of me. And so things like serving become like second nature. Like I, I love God so much that I, I wanna serve. I wanna, I wanna give back. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna tell other people about this relationship that I have with Jesus. Even as we talk about being on the worship team, you know, this is, a, this is a thing that takes sacrifice. It takes a great deal of time. But inside of that, you get this opportunity to experience what it is to, to fully like engage. And when we watch people accept Christ and this moment happens where they begin to get excited about their faith journey, what can happen oftentimes is we can become more like the Pharisees where we try to be real practical about things. Practically, when that Pharisee says in the book of Mark, hey, she could have sold that and helped the poor. We can all see where he would get that from. But that wasn't what this moment was about. This moment was about pure sacrifice about coming to this place where this woman, if you can only imagine, if you had something, whatever your wage is, if you had something that cost a year's wage and you just came to Jesus and were like, I'm breaking it, I'm done with it, I'm over it. Like that's a moment where you're saying, none of the past matters to me anymore. None of who I was is important anymore. I want... I want to be fully in. I want to be fully committed. I want to fully experience what God has. When I hear people talk about, man, I, I, yeah, I would love to help more. I would love to do this. I'd love to do that. But I've just, I'm so busy, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, transformation needs to happen inside of our lives where we begin to understand that as believers, there should be fruit. Yeah. What is the fruit in your life? I love this because she broke the jar because there's no turning back. Amen. Some of us, when we come to this moment in our life where we, where we accept Christ and we say yes to him, that we will oftentimes, I'll talk to people and they'll say, well, yeah, I've got this stuff in my life that I really feel like God's telling me to let go of, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna hold on to it for a little while and just see if, it's, if it takes, right? And we would maybe never put words to it, but many of us actually will do that at times where maybe you hear a message and, and God begins to, the Holy Spirit begins to convict you of something and you know you need to let it go. And, and so you say, well, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna stop, I'm gonna stop watching that stuff, but I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna not, I'm not gonna put anything in place just in case later I wanna watch it more. Or I'm not gonna, I, I know I shouldn't probably hang out with that person anymore because they're not a good influence, but I'll just kind of ghost them for a few weeks and just in case this doesn't take, and then I'll go back to it. But this woman says, I, I am sold out on Jesus. I am so believing that this is different, that this is going to change everything for me. So this thing that was probably the most valuable thing that she owned, it was the thing that she needed to be successful in what she had been doing. But instead she takes this moment and not only does she pour it out, pouring it out is great, but you can always refill it. But she says, I'm breaking it. I'm done with it. It's over. 
I'm trusting God that this is a life change for me. Look at this story for a minute because those steeped in religion saw allowing Jesus to be around their table as sacrifice. This woman poured herself, her reputation, her finances, her emotions out on Jesus. And she realized in that moment that even that was not a sacrifice. It was a step towards freedom for her. Some of you, that's the way you are. My sacrifice is I come to church two or three times a month. When was the last time you poured your life out? When was the last time you gave sacrificially? When was the last time you ask God, what do you want from me? God, where can you use me? What can you have me do? God, your love for me is beyond anything that I could ever earn or deserve. So God, I'm not trying to earn your love because I can't. But what I am trying to say is thank you. Thank you. The aroma of this woman's life changed. She quit trying to hide who she was. And she started to be who he said that she was. See, it's great if you come to church and, and we have this opportunity at the end where, where I, I lead you through the, this, this moment where you accept Jesus into your life. And you say yes to him. And, and, and that's an incredible moment because in that moment, we know that scripture tells us that God forgives you of your sin. Then he removes your stuff from you. And, and now you, you get to be moved from a slave to a son and daughter of the most high king. But the thing that needs to happen is there's got to be an aroma change. There's got to be something that switches and at the church, we don't want to get to a place where we start telling you all the things that you need to change because we believe strongly that the Holy Spirit will do that. But what I don't want to see is somebody just go, okay, now I go to church. That's, everything's the same except for I just go to church. This woman pushed through. She pushed through the crowd. She didn't care what anybody thought. She came to this moment where she, she falls on her face in front of everybody who was scorning and mocking and, and probably so embarrassed for her that she was there. And she doesn't care. She just pours it out. She just pours it out. She'd been using this perfume to mask who she was and now she has a true life change there's no need for masks anymore my question to you today is what are you pouring out what in your life needs to change since you've started your relationship with Jesus Christ what are the things that you've held on to maybe it's a a sin that's a secret sin or maybe it's maybe it's just some things in your life that you felt as you prayed that God's saying hey you need to release that for some of you you hold so tight to some things that you just don't want to let go of and I look at this story and the guys who sat and mocked and and thought they knew better they don't get anything out of this but the woman who says I don't care what anybody else thinks I don't care about being comfortable. You got that would be the most uncomfortable dinner party. But she didn't care. She just wants Jesus. I don't know. I know that I can get so busy with stuff that I can just glide through times of worship, through opportunities in my prayer closet, through chances to be in his word. It just becomes habit. I don't want habit. I want passion. I want to push in. I want to see him. I want to experience him. And some of you, you need to hear this today because the God of the universe does see you. Jesus looked at this woman. 
He didn't look away like everyone else. He didn't mock her. He didn't say anything bad about her. Instead, he looked at her. And not only did he see who she was, he saw who she can be. And that's what he sees when he sees you. And I just really feel like tonight, there may be some of you that are in this room that you feel like there's no way that God could ever. But he can. Some of you are incredible stories of transformation. Some of you, I could call you up one by one and you could talk about how you broke the jar in your life. How you came to a place where you let go of all of the things so that you could pursue Jesus. And I'll guarantee you that nobody that would come up and say that would have any regrets about doing so. But as I look at what Jesus even said to these Pharisees, he said, those who have been forgiven much, love much. I think for some of us who don't have the really hard story, we're the ones that can get trapped in this idea of not loving much. God's calling his church to love him much, to pursue him much, to pour out much, to let go of the past, to let go of your things and chase him. I'm gonna ask everybody to close your eyes with me for the next few moments. And as we wrap this time up the, this evening, I wanna just take a moment And I wonder how many of you in the room today, if you were honest with me, would say, you know, Jason, I don't really have a relationship with God. Maybe you've been in church for a long time or you've, you just recently came back and and you're in a place where you don't, you're not actually actively pursuing who Jesus is. If that's you today, would you just do me a favor and lift up your hand and catch my eye? I want to pray with you before we leave the room today. Is there anybody like that at all that would just say, Jason, will you remember me? Yeah, bud. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would just say, Jason, will you remember me in this closing prayer? I just want to make my relationship right with God today. Thanks, man. I see you. Yeah, good job, bud. Take one more moment. Is there anybody else? All right. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody in the room, whether you raised your hand or you didn't, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer with me. And honestly, for some of you, this is that pushing through moment, that moment where maybe you were a little concerned, what would anybody think? doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Push through and get to him. He's waiting for you. Let's pray this prayer together. Will you repeat it after me, everyone in the room? Dear Jesus, thank you for your grace praise you that you love me, that you see me, that you have plans for me. Forgive me of my sin. Today I'm choosing to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, it's that moment of just coming to Jesus and saying, I want you. Jesus loves you and he's got big plans for you. Would you give those a round of applause who raise their hand? The worship team's gonna lead us in a little bit more worship. I'm just gonna wanna challenge you. I, last week I kind of gave you this same challenge, but I really feel like there are some of us in the room that we have become accustomed to being a, a, a watcher of worship. This woman didn't just stand off to the side and watch. She said, I don't care what anybody thinks, I'm gonna worship. I don't care what it looks like, I'm gonna get to Jesus. And I just wanna challenge you. Maybe your day has been hard, your week has been hard, your mind has been elsewhere. Will you just take this moment right now? And some of you, I think it it means even coming and finding a space at the altar or coming and getting prayed for. Just step out from what's comfortable into the uncomfortable. Because oftentimes when we do that, all of a sudden we find ourselves in a new place where we meet Jesus in a different way than we have before. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you for the story of this woman. I thank you, God, for her willingness to step into the uncomfortable. And I pray for your church right now that, God, we would move from what is comfortable to that which is uncomfortable as we passionately pursue who you are. I thank you for your amazing love for us. And I pray that, God, we will be a church that loves much. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand as a worship.